My name is Michael Jennings. I'm an HPC sysadmin at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. We're an office of science lab for the United States Department of Energy. Um, I wish I knew Spanish. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, so, and I have a tendency to speak quickly. So feel free to tell me to slow down, speed up, shut up, whatever as necessary. <laughs> Uh, I work in the High Performance Computing Services Group. We deliver HPC services, uh, clusters, server administration, and so <coughs> forth to researchers at Berkeley Lab. You might have heard of NERSC, the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. Uh, NERSC is a national user facility, and they can't really provide services to the individuals at Berkeley Lab. So that's where we come in. They come to us. We can build them a cluster. We can help them determine what they need to buy, how much they can afford, and so forth. I also do cybersecurity work, um, especially on the research side of things. Um, I could tell you some interesting things about using Docker containers and some clever VLAN tricks to do interesting monitoring if you're ever interested. I also work at the University of California, Berkeley. We have a contract with them to do uh, research computing services down on campus as well. I don't know if there are any science fiction fans in the room or if the series Babylon 5 actually made it out of the United States, but I kind of hope so. Um, there were a couple of races in the show one known as the Vorlons, the other known as the Shadows. And the Vorlons always ask everybody one question. Who are you? So that's my question to start off today. Who are you, or who are we as the HBC community? What are we about? There are basically two halves of the community, so to speak. We have the scientists, people doing the actual research, the actual computation, the, the things that really matter on the systems that we're talking about. And then we have the engineers, people like me, who could not explain dark matter or dark energy to save our lives, but we think it's awesome, and we want to make sure that the people who know what they're talking about can do cool stuff with the systems we provide. Scientists come in all shapes, sizes, and flavors. Everybody from the big name researchers that everybody on the planet has heard of, Stephen Hawking, big example, project leads, postdocs, all the way down to student interns who are kind of the bottom rung on the totem pole, sorry, so to And everybody in between, lots and lots of different types of scientists, lots of different roles out there in academia. And simil similarly, on the engineering side, we have a wide variety of people. We've got system administrators, we've got the cluster architects, we've got the network guys. All of these different people coming together and trying to enable science. The shadows also have a question. What do you want? So what are we all about? What are we trying to accomplish? And all of those different types of scientists all essentially want the same thing. They want to run their jobs. They want to get results that are fast <coughs> and accurate. And that's pretty much it. At the end of the day, that's all they all want. They want to be able to get their work done as quickly and accurately as possible. So what about the engineers, the sysops? What do we want? Very simply, we want happy customers. We want our weekends. We want our nights. We don't want the pager going off in the middle of the night because something screwed up. And we want to make sure that our scientists are able to do what they are trying to do, get their science done as quickly and efficiently as possible. 
These are pretty simple needs, but the reality is that actually getting to that point is a very, very complicated problem. There are lots of parts and pieces that have to come together and work together very effectively in order to accomplish this. And there are a lot of things that are standing in the way of us providing reliable, effective cluster systems. I've got some of them up here. I'm not going to bother going through and reading them to you. You can all read quite competently on your own. But there's a wide variety of hardware and software problems that can come up. And these are all things that can keep us from accomplishing those goals that that I mentioned on the last slide, getting the science done. So what do we do about this? Well, for a long time, there were two basic solutions to this problem. We could fly by the seat of our pants and wait till angry scientist calls us up and complains that his job died or his job's not running or the scheduler is pissing him off or whatever it might be. That's never good. Especially if these are the people that we're trying to serve and these are the people that ultimately pay our salaries. If they aren't there, then we aren't there. So that's not the right approach. The other possibility is we can all go off in our little fiefdoms and cobble something together that works for us and call it a day. And that's great, but there are literally hundreds of HPC sites all around the world essentially shooting for the same goals. So there's got to be a better way. And I'm hoping that you'll agree that this project might be that better way. When I went to go out into the community and look at what other people were doing for monitoring node health, I quickly discovered that the vast majority of sites either didn't know that this capability existed or they hadn't had the time, energy, or wherewithal to do anything with it. And the few sites that said, hey, yes, we're actually using this, had cobbled together a bunch of random shell scripts that were highly customized for their environment, or had taken something somebody else did and modified it and then never talked to them about what they'd done. <coughs> Everybody was even either doing their own thing or doing nothing at all. So I thought that there might just be a possibility to create a community around making sure as best we can that the systems that we're providing our scientists are as reliable as possible. So what NHC provides is a modular, flexible, and extensible framework for checking node health and reporting back about it. Ultimately, the goal is that there are certain things that are unique about each site, but needing to run the checks and report on the checks, that's not one of them. That's something that's common. So all of the things that are common about performing this task should already be done for you, or pretty close. And the only things that each individual site's administrative team should have to worry about is the stuff that's unique to them. So NHC comes with a fairly large variety of existing checks and we obviously welcome additional contributions from other sites that would like to use it. Uh, we support as many scheduler and resource manager combinations as we can. Uh, our best support to date is with Torque, Moab, and with Slurm. There's also support for SGE slash SGE slash UGE slash everybody else's GE. Um, they all kind of work the same. So there's support for that. Um, I'm still working on native support for platform LSF, but you can run it on an LSF system. 
And pretty much anything that we don't have specific support for, you can still make it work. You just might have to run it out of cron or, or some <coughs> other different mechanism. And as a software engineer, one of my favorite things that probably nobody else cares about, but I still appreciate it, the entire script and all of the checks that are written for it come complete with unit tests. So there's a testing, unit testing framework that I created for bash scripts, and each of the checks that I write, I also write unit tests to go with them before they get committed. So every new check has unit tests that go along with it. So if I change anything and something breaks, I hopefully know about it pretty quickly. And more recently, I created some additional companion tools to go along with this that I'll talk about later on. This is a very feature-rich implementation. One of my goals was to, as I said, try and cover all of the bases that are common across sites in general. <coughs> And so anything and everything that I could think of that would be a common pitfall, I tried to address. One example, if you're using Torque as your resource manager, when Torque executes the node health check script, it blocks until that script returns. It's single threaded and it actually does uh, a system call and waits for the, in, the output to come back from that script. So for every node that's running a node health check script, PBS mom is just going to be sitting there doing nothing until that script completes. And obviously, if that script were to hang for whatever reason, then that node is completely out of commission. So as I was writing this, I went to great lengths to try and make sure that it was as reliable as possible, at least in terms of being able to return control back to its caller. I did that in a couple of ways. It supports something called detach mode, which I'll go into detail later. But basically, that allows an HC to return control back to whomever called it as quickly as possible. I also went to great lengths, and I would say probably pathological lengths, to reduce the number of subprograms that get executed to an absolute minimum. Anybody who's written a shell script will tell you that a lot of what's in there is going to be pipes to grep and sed and awk and all sorts of external utilities. And what you might not realize is that for every single one of those pipes, you've got at least one, possibly multiple subprograms that are getting executed. And when you're just sitting there at your command prompt running stuff, that's no big deal. But when you've got a situation where a node could be in a bad state, and you don't know if those subprograms are going to even be there anymore, Every single one of those that gets executed is a potential liability. So anywhere and everywhere that I could eliminate pipes or subshells or anything like that, I did. And apart from the tests that might need to shell out to a command like PS, there are fewer than fingers number of subprogram executions in all of NHC. So it's extremely, extremely efficient, and almost everything that's done in there is native bash. So you can run under your uh, resource manager, you can run under your scheduler, you can run out of cron, you can run via pdish or some other sort of parallel shell, or you can do all of the above, and all of those are supported. We've got support for any of the types of uh, account management entry systems as long as it feeds back into GetHint, it should be able to pull from anywhere. And there's an automatic watchdog timer. So if 
So you can set a timeout for how long an HD is allowed to execute. And if it gets to the point where that timeout expires, it kills itself off and again returns control back to the program that called it. <coughs> One of the other great features is that you can have a single configuration file for NHC that applies to your entire cluster. So you don't have to maintain one config for each node or one config for each type of node or anything like that. You've got a single configuration file and it can apply to every machine in your entire cluster. In fact, if you've got unique enough host names for all your systems, you could theoretically have a single config for every system you want to use it on, no matter how many of those you have. So the general syntax is basically some sort of host mask, a double pipe, and then stuff. And that stuff is interpreted directly by bash, so it can literally be anything that's valid bash. Generally, it's going to be either a check line or possibly exporting a shell variable or something like that. But it, it really can be anything. And I've had uh, users get very creative in some of the ways that they have instrumented that stuff in order to do fairly exotic types of things. So it's, it, the syntax is extremely flexible. The host mask that's on the left hand side is basically used to match against the host name that it finds itself running on. So when you execute NHC, it goes, it looks at the host name, and as it's parsing the config file, it checks that first mask against the host name that it's running on it. Anything that doesn't match, it just ignores. So the host mask, by default, is a glob expression. Glob just means wildcard. So a wildcard expression for the node. This could be uh, any of those examples up there, or star obviously will match anything. If you put slashes on either side, you can match via a regular expression. Pretty simple stuff. We also support range expressions. Uh, if you've ever used PDSH, it supports node numerical ranges. This is very similar to that. The only exception um, you can't put commas inside the square brackets. You have to do something like that, separate them out with a comma on the outside. That's the only exception, but everything else that's valid PDIS should work. And then there's a brand new feature called an external match expression. If you use Werewolf and you have uh, node groups or different clusters in Werewolf, or if you use something called cluster shell or NIS or any of those external utilities that allow you to, to define groups of nodes, then you can write uh, some configuration that will allow you to use those as match expressions in NHC. And I'll go into detail about uh, how that works and some examples a little bit later on. And so as you can see, any one line shell command will work. Um, obviously, it might be a little confusing that double pipe is that and double pipe is also that, but it, it, it works. Trust me. Now, the one caveat that you need to keep aware of is the entire config file gets parsed all in one shot. So if you have uh, something up in the top that modifies a variable or something like that and you're trying to use it later on to exclude certain nodes from configuration, you can't do that. So as I said, there are uh, a lot of built-in checks. So I'll just quickly go over uh, a few of them here. So uh, everybody's used the dmessage command, right? So there's a check that allows you to look at the output of dmessage to see if something has come up that you need to know about. 
There are general checks for the output of an arbitrary <coughs> command or the return status of an arbitrary command. So you can run something and check the return value or check what it outputs and key off of things that you might want to know about. And actually, this check is implemented as a wrapper around this one. So there's a lot of flexibility you can get out of this check. You can have an arbitrary number of matches that you're trying to match against and an arbitrary number of messages that you can return. Uh, DMI data, basically your, your BIOS data or your um, machine configuration data. You can, if you've ever run DMI decode, it spews out a whole bunch of BIOS and processor information, shows you what hardware you have on the system. So there are checks in there to match against any of those items that you want. You can use this to check your BIOS version, make sure you have the appropriate version of firmware. Um, you can use this to verify that you have a particular piece of hardware installed or a particular type of DIMM installed or a particular speed of memory installed and so forth. You can check the contents of a file. Uh, you have, for each one of these you have, you can only have one file name, but you can have as many matches as you want. This is useful for verifying the contents of configuration files, for example, if you want to make sure that your torque config file doesn't get overwritten, things like that, you can do that. Um, you can also look at that's a password, make sure you have particular accounts in there, that type of thing. There are a couple of checks for, um, for file properties. If you recall, I am very pathological about minimizing subprograms. So Bash has a built-in called test that allows you to look at particular file properties. Is it readable? Is it writable? Is it a socket? Is it a symlink? And so forth. So this is essentially a wrapper around the built-in test command. However, it's not <coughs> powerful enough to cover all the bases. So if there are things that you're looking for that aren't covered by this, then you can also use the full-blown stat command. It has to shell out and actually run stat and gather up all that information. However, once you've done it, the information that it returns back for that file or however many files you give it, that's all cached. So once you've run stat, that information is there and it will reuse it later on if it needs to. There are several different file system checks. Um, the most basic one check if stuff is mounted. Uh, any sysadmin knows that when you boot a machine, there's at least some possibility that a storage device that you mount over the <coughs> network was missing when you booted the node, or has gone down, or if, you, if a disk fails, like slash temp is a really good example, if a disk fails a lot of times, temp and other file systems will get remounted read-only. So you can check for that using these checks and make sure that everything that's supposed to be there is actually there. I can't tell you before we had this how many times we had users emailing us complaining, my job failed because I can't write to temp, or my job failed because my home directory is missing, or something like this. These are very basic system properties that, you know, having a user have to report this to us is frankly embarrassing. So that was one of the first checks I implemented because we just we hit it way too often. So um, the mount checks are all done using um, proc mounts. So there's no execution of a subcommand involved there. However, the other file system checks, the ones that look at size and utilization, and the ones that look at inodes, those have to call df. If you're a storage admin, or if you spend much time talking to your storage admin, you will know that running df is one of the worst things you can do when there's a potential that something might be missing. Because if you just run df, or you run df on a network storage device, and that device has gone out to lunch, 
DF is just going to sit there and keep sitting there until that storage comes back. If you recall the situation about Torque running this single threaded, if you have a check that runs DF and something has gone away, that's a problem. And that's one of the big reasons I put all of that watchdog timer and everything in there to avoid <laughs> DF hanging in HC. If you only want to look at the size of local file systems, Generally, if you're on a compute node, you don't need to be, you don't need to have every single one of all your compute nodes looking at the size of your scratch file system. You can do that from the master node. And the same should be true of pretty much any of your network file systems. So what I recommend for your compute nodes is that you only look at the local file systems, things like temp, or if you have a local scratch, that type of thing. And you can modify the, the arguments that NHC will pass to DF so that it only looks at local file systems. And that prevents any network-based hangs. Uh, anybody who's worked in biology or genomics, um, ever run out of inodes? Yeah, I... I got a new definition of lots of files when I started working with the phylogenomics group at Berkeley. Um, we actually managed to not only run the device out of inodes, but there were so many inodes on this NetApp that we actually prevented the backup software from backing up the file system because it didn't know what to do with 65 million inodes on one single file system. And this was back in 2007. So we're, we're up to a, over a billion on a file system now. Uh, so very useful checking to make sure you have sufficient number of inodes free if you work in anything in biology will a lot of times involve lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of small files. Okay, hardware checks. There are a number of different things you can look at for hardware. Uh, CPU info, you check sockets, cores, and threads. So if you've got a dual socket host, obviously that's going to be two. Then this is the number of cores that you have, and this is the number of threads. So if you've got hyper-threading turned on, then this will be double that. If you have it turned off, then those will be the same. Uh, for us, at least historically, we've always wanted to make sure hyperthreading was off because in most cases, it's not so good for HPC. Uh, there are exceptions, but more often than not, hyperthreading is, is a, lo a net loss. And so we configure all of our systems to turn hyperthreading off, but occasionally our intern would miss one or two or 15 and we needed this to make sure that that setting was correct and to be able to flag any that got missed. Uh, networking devices, Ethernet is supported. We also support MirrorNet for those of you still living in 2005. And we have InfiniBand. You can specify the rate that it's supposed to be talking at. Um, for example, QDR is going to be 40, FDR 56, and so on and so forth. And you can specify the name of the device you're looking for if you want to look for a particular device or if you have more than one. Memory. Who's ever lost a DIM before? Yeah. So the fun thing about memory, Linux seems to have some sort of randomization algorithm that it uses to determine exactly how many bytes of physical memory it tells you you have. So you can check total memory. You can check physical memory and or you can check swap. And then we also have an MCE log check for looking for machine check exceptions. If you're running Moab and Torque, we have a few checks that are specific to those pieces of software. Um, I don't have the equivalents for Slurm yet, 
but that's a work in progress. For network, you can do pings and you can look for sockets in particular states and we also have support for NVIDIA's uh, HealthMon utility, part of the Tesla development kit. You can use that to check the health of your GPUs. We have lots of different checks for processes. I'm going to go into detail on most of those here in a little bit. We also have checks for resource consumption. Um, generally, on an HPC compute node, you don't necessarily care as much how much of the resources are being used. But for interactive nodes, this has proven very useful for um, killing off naughty user processes on places where they shouldn't be. So, how do you get started? Well, thankfully, it's pretty darn easy to get started using NHC, and you can do it in five minutes or less. So the first step, obviously, is to download the software. We're on GitHub. You may not have heard of GitHub, but it's a, a very good collaborative site out on the web. If you want, you can um, build from source and install directly from source. However, we usually recommend uh, installing from RPMs. We have uh, a YUM repository that you can put in and automatically get the upgrades. Once you've installed the RPM or installed from source, you just have to uh, edit the configuration file. There's a utility that I'll talk about later called GenConf, which will actually generate a config file for you. I typically recommend running GenConf and then merging the sample config file with the generated config file. And that's usually a very good head start. Once you've got the configuration file you want, at least a starting config, then you just have to determine how you want to run it. You can run it out of cron, and we have a wrapper script that makes that really easy to do. If you're using torque, then these are the variables that you want to set in your mom config. If you're using slurm, then you want to set these two variables in your slurm.conf. In SGE, we run as a load sensor. So you just want to set load sensor and load thresholds for NHC. If you're running LSF, then currently you have to run out of <coughs> In the future, I'm going to set it up as what's called a load index. I don't have that yet, but uh, and if if anyone out there is using LSF, I believe Barcelona is. Last I knew, if you're looking at using this and you're interested in helping to get better LSF support, I would love to work with you. So this is what all those steps look like. Pretty simple and straightforward. So it's really easy to build uh, RPMs from the tarball once you do the tarball. And then this is uh, what I just mentioned about running GenConf and merging the config files. And then you, once you're done, you just run NHC and see what happens. This is how you would run out of Tron using the NHC wrapper script. You can mail the results somewhere to whatever email address you want. Uh, this, the capital X option, will expire the results after six hours. So previously, we had a little helper program that you could use to run it out of Tron, and it would save the results on disk. And it would compare the new results with the old results and if they match, it wouldn't send you an email. Well, that's great if you're young and smart and never forget anything ever. But unfortunately, for those of us who are getting old and senile, we forget things. So this allows you to say, OK, every six hours, go ahead and delete the old results and start fresh. That way, I get a new email every so often to remind me, oh, there's a problem that I need to address. You don't have to use that option, but if you do, then you, you can enable periodic reminders. And then just the rest of the command line is 
options that you're passing to NHC itself. Here's the config for a sample torque. Here's the config for a sample slur. Pretty straightforward. Example config file. I'm not going to go through every single one of these in detail. But um, you can get a copy of the slides and use this for reference if you'd like. So here I've got uh, what I call an out-of-band configuration. In-band is when you're running under a scheduler resource manager and you're very sensitive to sub-processes and resource utilization and things like that. Out-of-band is running in cron where you don't care as much about those things and you can do some of the more uh, resource intensive checks. And if you see down here, this is stuff that's supposed to only run on the master rather than the compute nodes for obvious reasons. And here again, I've got some checks that are specific for the nodes, some checks that are specific for the master, and then some that apply equally to everything. So I'll go into a little bit of detail on some of the checks. The first resource check we're going to look at is CPU utilization. If you've got somebody who's got a runaway process on an interactive node, they might be using 97, 98, or even 100% CPU. So you can specify a threshold as a percentage of CPU utilization. And you can trigger on uh, matches against the process name or with an exclamation mark, that's the negation. So anything but this, you can look at uh, the owner of the process. Again, you can negate. So you can look for non-root processes, for example. Um, the dash zero means that it's non-fatal. If you just want NHC to look for something and potentially kill processes that match but not alert you or not take the node offline, you can make individual checks non-fatal that way. Uh, typically, and this is true in general, when NHC detects a failure condition, it doesn't matter how many more there might be. You've already determined that the node is not OK to run jobs. So it exits immediately and tells you what problem it found. That might not be the desirable behavior. If you're running it on your master node, and you want to know about all of the problems that might currently exist, <clears throat> you don't necessarily want it to stop at the first one. You want to know about all of them. So the, uh, the dash A tells it to go through and find all of the problems that it can possibly find, rather than just stopping at the first one. Uh, the actions you can have, you can tell it to log to its own log file. You can have it log to syslog. I was talking to somebody uh, a couple nights ago about syslog. NHC relies fairly heavily on logging to syslog as its default mechanism of um, alerting. We use a syslog aggregator. All of our nodes log to the master node via syslog, and then the master <coughs> node re-blasts all of that information to a central syslog server. So uh, that's what we recommend. But if you have a different setup, um, I'm going to be looking at making that pluggable. So you could potentially have a JSON output to some other log aggregator, like FluentD or Logstash. Or so on and so forth. But right now, it's its, it's own log file and or syslog. Uh, you can have it kill the process if you want. This is particularly handy if you're talking, if you're looking for uh, particular MPI processes. Uh, if you use OpenMPI, you've probably seen ORTED, ORTED. For every MPI process, 
that's running, you're going to have its parent process, this open MPI thing called ORTED. There are probably similar things for other MPI implementations. And if you kill off the MPI job, you end up with this ORTED just kind of sitting there for who knows how long. So this allows you to not only kill the rogue process, but also kill whatever its parent is. Now be careful, because in general, the parent process of something that's run away might be the user's shell, and users don't like getting kicked off nodes. You can re-nice processes if you want them to continue to be able to run but not interfere with other people on the node, you can re-nice it to something humongous. And you can run any other arbitrary command that you want. So this is essentially the same check, only you're looking at memory consumption. You can specify the memory as just a number or you can add suffixes like g or m or whatever for gigabytes, megabytes, kilobytes, whatever. Uh, kilobytes are the default. You can look at, uh, well this check in particular, check PSMM, looks at the total memory consumption of RAM plus swap or the virtual size of the process. Vsize includes all the memory that the operating system has assigned to this process. So if you have something that allocates a bunch of memory, Vsize will go up and up and up and up. Just because it frees memory doesn't mean Vsize is going to go back down. So its actual memory usage may not be that number. So just keep that in mind. And this includes stuff that's been swapped out to, to disk. If you want to specifically look at the stuff that's resident in RAM, then you want to use the FISMEM check, because it looks at the resident set size, or RSS, rather than the complete memory space of the application. And again, all of the actions that we had before are the same. All of the matches that we had before are the same, etc. And with, for this, for the physical memory, you can specify it as a percentage of memory or as an absolute size. Either one works. If you don't put any sort of indicator, then the assumption is that you mean kilobytes. You can also look at time. So you can set a limit for how much CPU time a process is allowed to consume, and if it goes over, you can terminate it. Uh, again, everything else is the same. And we support minutes and seconds as the abbreviation for time consumption. Okay, story time. I got uh, an email from a guy at NERSC who was trying to get NHC working on... Uh oh What happened? I tried the button on the front. Uh, no, I think it's one of the buttons you will... Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> where was I? Okay, so he was in the process of implementing NHC on one of the NERSC supercomputers called Carver. And I was helping him get everything going, and he said to me, you know, it would be really nice if rather than just telling me that this service is down, like SSH, don't just tell me that SSH isn't running anymore, fix it. And I got to thinking, you know, that's actually not a bad idea. And the more I thought about it, the more applications of this principle I could come up with. In general, don't just tell me that there's a problem. If there's a way to automatically fix the problem, let's go ahead and fix it. Now, the checks that I had already written for looking at system processes, uh, in particular system daemons, and telling if they were missing, the syntax wasn't sufficient to do this, so I created an entirely new check called Check PS Service. And you can use this to look for system services. 
It's basically going to look through your process list and match against the command line. You can do it three different ways. Uh, this, this service is specifically the name of the service, as in Etsy init.d, whatever, or SBIN service, whatever, or system CTL start, whatever. That service name is what you're going to specify here. If you're lucky, that service name is the same as the name of the daemon program that you want it to look for. You're not always lucky. So if you need to specify it, you can say dash D and the name of the daemon process that you want it to look for. Or if you need to be a little more complicated, you can specify a full-fledged match string. If you recall from the config file syntax slide, the whole thing about globs and regular expressions and range expressions and external matches, that's called a match string. And anything that's valid as a match string, you can use anywhere you see a match string. And if you prefix a match string with an exclamation mark, you negate it. And that works anywhere that match strings are accepted. So it's a very powerful idiom. So typically, here you're going to be looking for either a glob expression or a regular expression if you want to get fancy. But most of the time you don't need to because the process names tend to match up pretty well. <coughs> so once you have discovered that either something is running that shouldn't be or something's not running that should be, then you need to be able to take action. So the actions that you can take uh, you can start the service. Generally, if you say restart and it's not running, that'll still work. But A, there are some services where the init script is written such that that won't work. And B, more importantly, in the particular example of SSHD, if you try to do a restart on SSHD when S the main SSHD, the listening daemon, is not running, it will go and it will kill off every other SSHD process that it finds. So if there are any user sessions that are open to that node that got established, oops, got established before SSHD died, it will kill them all off. Not so good. So this allows you to specifically just do SSHD start rather than restart so that you don't kill everybody off. You can also do a restart, just for giggles. You can stop something that isn't supposed to be running. We support something called cycling, which is basically just a stop and then a brief sleep and then a start. Or you can do a direct kill. You can send a kill signal directly to the daemon process if, for whatever reason, the, the SBIN service stuff doesn't work for a particular example. You can also do arbitrary actions with dash E or dash capital E. This is for if something should be running but isn't. This is for something that should not be running but is. Uh, the latest version, uh, the way I had it before, if, if it, it took action, it would send that action into the background so that, again, it didn't delay the processing, didn't risk hanging anything up, etc. But I, I heard feedback from some customers who preferred to be able to make sure that whatever start or restart they had done actually worked. So they wanted NHC to make sure that it worked before it just continued on. So I added options to verify that this stuff actually, or this stuff, did what it was supposed to do. And if it didn't, it would fail the check. If it succeeds, the check passes. This is a lowercase v. I know it's kind of hard to see the distinction. This just means perform the task synchronously. If you use a capital, capital V, it will take the additional action of 
looking again at the process list to make sure that if you killed something, it's really gone, or if you started something, that it's really started. Just keep in mind that that does take an additional sub-process and additional time, so be careful with that. Uh, obviously, if you're using any of these three options, then that's negative logic. It means you're looking for something that you don't want running, and if it finds it running, then the check fails. Anything else is positive logic. If you find a match, then that's a success. And here again is that dash zero for a, a non-fatal check. I went into a little bit of detail about the mount check earlier, so I don't need to go into a whole lot again, but I do want to point out that this check also has the ability to fix the problem potentially that it finds. So if you tell it to look for a file system that's supposed to be mounted and it finds it not mounted, you can, if you choose, i.e. if you pass uh, options that you want it to mount with, you can and the, the dash R for remount. You can tell it, if this is missing, go ahead and try to mount it. It can't fix everything, like if you have slash temp remount or read only because the disk failed, it's not going to fix your disk for you. So it's not a panacea, but it can uh, fix missing mount points. Or uh, missing mounts. It can also address missing mount points. So if you have it checking for a particular mounted directory and that mount point doesn't exist, it will create it for you automatically. It also offers a feature for auto mount. If you have auto mounted file systems, you, you can let it know that it's an auto mounted file system and it will do IO to that file system to trigger the auto mount before it checks to make sure that it's mounted. And then there, since checking for read write, checking for read only is such a common idiom, there are shortcuts for those two options. This just gives you a list of the different options for the stat that you can check stuff. Um, you can look at permissions, you can look at ownerships, you can look at timestamps. Pretty much anything that the stat call will return to you, you can write a check for. If you can get away with just using the test command, obviously that's going to be more efficient, so I recommend going that route. And um, if you don't know what each of these options does, it's just man test or man bash, and it will go over each of those. Again, you can look at file contents, as mentioned earlier. Uh, this check looks at the load average, one, five, and or 15 minute load average on the system. At the end, I will show some URLs for some videos of previous talks that I've given. Uh, it's kind of neat if you want to go back and, and look at where we've come from. But this check in particular was written in front of a live studio audience as a demo for how easy it is to write new checks for NHC. So if you want to see that, uh, feel free to go and check out that video. All right, I'm getting low on time, so I'm going to try to hurry up. Uh, so I mentioned the command output check. So it will basically run this command and look for any number of strings in the output to match against. Again, these are match strings, so they can be any of those match syntaxes I talked about earlier. And each lowercase m match string will have a capital M message associated with it. 
that defines the error message that gets printed out if the check fails. Uh, command status, if you only care about the return code of the command, you don't care about the output, it's much more efficient to use this because this check has to save the entire output into an array in memory, which if there's a lot of output, that can be a huge amount of memory. It can also be a huge amount of time. So if all you care about is the exit code, this guy redirects everything to dev null. So you don't have to store all the output if you don't care about it. Uh, Moab stuff. This check is used for compute node cleanup. If you have jobs that leave processes left around, or if you have users who are SSHing directly to nodes to bypass your scheduler, this check looks at who owns each of the processes on your system. It then looks at who the resource manager or the scheduler says is allowed to be running. Basically, who has jobs running on the node, plus any system users you tell it that are authorized. Anybody who's got a process on the node who's not on that list, you can tell it what you want it to do with them. You can log to syslog, you can kill the process off, etc. For torque, uh, this is done by parsing the job file. For slurm, it looks at the ownership of the job script. Uh, unfortunately, with Slurm, that only works on the main node of a parallel job, so it doesn't work properly with parallel jobs. This is also a, a different check for uh, getting rid of rogue processes. For this one, it works differently. Any process that's spawned by your scheduling system should have a particular parent process somewhere back up in its lineage. So for torque, that's going to be PBS mong. For slurm, that's going to be a slurm step D, and so forth. So for each user process on the system, it traces the lineage of that process back up from parent to parent to parent to parent until either it hits one of those processes that it knows to be looking for, or init. If it gets to init before it finds one, then you can take actions. You can check for sockets in various states, uh, useful for listening sockets, daemons. Uh, I talked about an HC wrapper. That just goes over the details of the syntax for it. Detach mode I mentioned earlier. Basically detach mode tells it to return to the calling program immediately. So it detaches and the foreground process returns. The background process goes off and runs all the checks. Then the next time around, the process that stays in the foreground looks at the results from the last run and returns those results while the background process does another round of checks. So basically there's a one cycle delay on the returning of results. The benefit is it takes very, very, very little time to do that. So it's an almost instantaneous return to the calling program. But the negative is that there's a delay in returning results. Um, pretty much out of time, so I'm going to skip a few things here. There is good information on these slides, though, so definitely worth checking. Um, we recently renamed the project for clarity. You don't have to run Werewolf to use this, so we renamed it. External match syntax really quickly. You specify a delimiter character and the command that you're going to run to check for matches. And then you can use it like this, and then that string gets passed into this command to determine if the current host name matches based on like a node group or whatever. So extremely useful. And your delimiter character can be either the same character at the beginning and end, or you can have 
two different characters. And it doesn't matter what's in between, it just looks at the first character of the string and the last character of the string. This is just a quick look at what's currently planned for the future. So if you're interested in helping with development or you have ideas for checks that you'd like to see written but you're not sure if you can write them yourself, definitely open to submitting issues and or pull requests on GitHub or Bitbucket. Uh, these are the videos that I mentioned before. This is the one where I did the check writing. So if you're looking to write checks of your own, this is a good resource to, to take a look at. I don't really, I don't necessarily have time for questions, but if there are questions, um, if I can't answer them now, I, I'll be around the rest of the day. Feel free to email me, catch me on IRC or Slack or whatever. So, all right, thank uh, you very much. <laughs>